This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning. My name is Doug Baker. I'm senior pastor here at Marvin United Methodist Church. On behalf of the church family, let me welcome you to our Sunday morning broadcast. May God bless you through the proclamation of His Word and fill you with great joy. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and they asked, where's the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and we have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed in all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi, secretly found out from them the exact time that the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and he said, go and search carefully for the child. And as soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. I feel like saying liar, liar, pants on fire. <laughs> but that's not in the scripture. <laughs> After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead and led them, and it stopped over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down, and they worshipped him. And then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. What a joy to have you here in this first Sunday of uh, this new year. What a great way to start our celebration uh, for this worship time as we conclude Christmas time and as we share together in this Epiphany celebration. I'm glad that you're here. Let us pray. God, in these moments, as we prepare our hearts to share in Holy Communion, I pray that you might speak through me, that the words spoken might be inspired by your Holy Spirit, and that you would open our hearts to your truth this day, that we might hear a word from you as we gather to worship the Christ, in whose name we pray, amen. Well, I don't know about you and where your decorations are in, in, at, at home. We're kind of in a half uh, undecorated state at our house. Uh, but uh, some people like to take their decorations down immediately after Christmas. But here at Marvin Church, we follow a Christmas season, the Christian year. And uh, the Christmas season ends today officially with uh, the celebration of Epiphany. You had to have time for those wise men to make their way to celebrate Christ's birth and to bring their gifts. And so we celebrate today Epiphany. Those mysterious foreigners from the East possibly from Persia or modern day Iran or Iraq, who made the visit after a 900 mile journey that probably took them months to get there. I'm sure they encountered all kinds of hardship and, and distractions and things that maybe during the journey caused them to wonder if they would make it there or not, but they made their way all the way to Jerusalem and then to Bethlehem to worship Christ. So even though we may move on, and we may be quick to put away the, the, the gifts and put away the decorations and begin the new year thinking about New Year's resolutions, thinking about college football playoffs or NFL playoffs. We do give thanks for the fact that Christmas lingers and that the Christmas season as it ends today gives us time to be in reflection today about what it means to follow Christ. Jesus Christ has made the largest impact in my life of any decision that I've ever made. And so I wanna invite you to join me this morning in recommitting your life to Jesus Christ as we kneel here at the chancel rail. The image that you've seen on the front of your bulletin is one that I encountered many years ago, very early in my ministry. Not exactly this image, but something quite like it. I was given a book sometime around my ordination, sometime around my first appointment into ministry, and in that uh, little table, uh, coffee table book, there was an image of a rock being thrown into a glass pond, if you will, and out of where that rock went in, there were ripples of water that went out. 
And I remember in that book was a quote from Mother Teresa. It says, I alone cannot change the world, but I can cast a stone across the waters and create many ripples. I want to remind you as we go into this new year, friends, that your actions, your commitments, the things that you do for Christ as you serve him, they do make a difference. Just as our children have blessed us this morning with their example of generosity and how this will make a difference in the lives of some of the children in our community, there are ripple effects that occur as we serve Christ and as we worship him. And so today, as we come together on this first Sunday of the year, And as we begin a new sermon series, we're going to be talking about the commitments that enlarge life. And we'll be talking about when we get the commitment right, then the ripple effects of that will then help us to have a more abundant life in Jesus Christ. I heard it once said, we make commitments and then our commitments make us. And I think there's some truth to that. I made a decision at age, I guess, about 15 or 16 to follow Jesus Christ, and that commitment has formed and shaped my life for many, many years. I made a decision to marry Gina, my wife, and that commitment has formed and shaped my life for many, many years. We made a commitment to have children, and that has formed and shaped our lives for for many, many years. And so, friends, we make commitments, whether they be health commitments, growth commitments professionally, growth commitments spiritually, we make those commitments and those commitments help form who we are. As followers of Jesus Christ, the first and foremost commitment we make and what we renew today is our commitment to Jesus Christ. Matthew 6, 33 says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Seek first the kingdom of God. So let's return to our scripture lesson. Let's celebrate the commitment of these wise men who we know very little about. Were they kings? Probably not. Astrologers maybe, wise men that gave uh, instructions and guidance to kings when they made decisions, probably from Persia. But they were the first ones to seek the Lord. They were the first ones to desire to seek this one being born king of the Jews. They were the one who came and brought these gifts and worshiped Christ. And we know that they were committed and they had a reward for that commitment. They committed their resources. They committed supplies, gathering of servants, an entourage that would take them 900 miles. And and they gathered, uh, they had to also set aside and sacrifice their time because they had responsibilities, I'm sure, in the communities in which they lived. Maybe some of them had families and they had to walk away from that in order to make this commitment to pursue this baby king. So let's look more closely at what guided them, what inspired them, what brought them to the place of wanting to find this one born king of the Jews. And first point, if you're taking notes this morning, is that they sought the help of the Holy Scriptures. And we don't know what scriptures they actually had. Scholars believe that these wise men who were 900 miles away from uh, where Jesus was born, probably somewhere in Persia, were uh, probably brought on to the fact of the scriptures by the Babylonian captivity when, when the Jews were deported out of Israel and sent to faraway lands. And when they went, they took the scriptures with them. And those scriptures had been held and somehow had gotten to the hands of these wise men and they had preserved them, they had cared for them, they had studied them. And so what they had, they, they followed in pursuit to look for this baby Jesus. As I think about that, I think of a quote that um, I've heard and I've used many in sharing with others. Commit, commit as much of yourself as you know to as much of Christ as you know. Commit as much of yourself as you know to as much as Christ as you know. These men didn't have all of the scriptures. They didn't have all the answers. They didn't know exactly where this king was to be born. All they knew that it would be probably in Israel and they knew Jerusalem would be the place to go and find a baby king. And with that, and with that faith, they went pursuing this baby king we call and know as Jesus. So today we recommit our lives to seeking Christ 
Maybe we don't have all the answers. Maybe we don't know all the truth. Maybe we can't quote all the scriptures. Maybe there are others that are more spiritually mature than us. But again, commit as much of yourself as you know to as much of Christ as you know. What inspires me about these men is they probably preserved and took care of the Holy Scriptures. And um, having been to the Dead Sea, having seen the Qumran community myself and where they found the scriptures that were found hidden away, Rick Jet, I'm looking at you because we were there together. Friends, having studied how the scriptures came into being for us, how William Tyndale uh, was burned at the stake for putting the scriptures into the English language, reminds me that the scriptures are very special. And friends, sometimes we take them for granted We have the Old and New Testaments that have been canonized by the church. We have the full revelation of God that has been given to us. And do we take advantage of that? Do we spend time in the scriptures? Can we not be inspired this day by these wise men who had only a little fragment, only a little piece of the puzzle, but that was enough to encourage them to go and look for Christ? Friends, we have the revelation of God as given to us in the scriptures, and we have no reason to not pick up that book and to study it. On Christmas Eve, we handed out a gift to those who came to worship on our campus. We have them available today. If you were not here and did not receive them, they're downstairs and also outside these doors. It's a field guide for daily prayer. It's a gift for you from the church to encourage you in 2019 to spend some time in the scripture. This has been a great gift to me just to kind of spruce up and kind of give me some new direction and change up my devotional life a little bit. And in the back of it, there's a reading of the Psalms for every day, a a couple of Psalms that you are to read. For every month, you'll continually read through the Psalms. And I just want to encourage you because as I was reading the Psalms this week from the daily devotional book, I came across Psalm 9, verse 10 that said, for those who know you and trust in you, for you are Lord, you will never forsake those who seek you. It was a great message. It was a great affirmation and and encouragement to hear those words and to ponder them as I read the Psalms that God will never forsake the one who truly seeks after him. And so let me just encourage you. You will not ever sit down with the word of God or with a devotional book and reading scriptures and never come away with something that God will place in your heart, something that will help you draw closer to Jesus Christ. Again, the wise men had only a part of the revelation but they were able, with God's help, to find Jesus. They found Jesus because what? They asked for help. You say, were these guys really men? Because do men really ask for directions? Yeah, maybe there was a woman amongst them. We don't really know. But friends, they asked for help. They went to Jerusalem and they went and they asked King Herod because they assumed that the king of that area in the palace of Jerusalem would be the place where you would find the one born king of the Jews. And Herod was, I'm sure, uh, polite. And yet, as the scripture says, he was disturbed and he was threatened by this news of a baby king, but he sought help. And God used that moment for his asking of help to help these wise men make their way. And so they asked, where is the one? And Herod said, I do not know, but I know people who can help you. So he brought in the teachers of the law. He brought in the chief priest. They searched the scriptures and they found that in the book of Micah, it said that it was the place of Bethlehem that the Messiah would be born. And so Herod sent them on to Bethlehem saying to them, Go find that baby king, and when you find him, report back to me. Friends, the lesson that we can take this morning is that we need to join others in the study of God's word. God has not called us to be spiritual lone rangers, to just pull out our devotional book and have our own devotions and and solely be, you're here today because you want to share with others in the proclamation of the word. You're in Sunday school classes because you found the secret of joining others in the study of God's scriptures. You've been in small groups and classes because you know there is power in joining with others in the study of God's word. Let me remind you that throughout the history of God's people, people have gathered At the base of mountains, as in the case of of Moses at Mount Sinai, they've gathered around the temple, they've gathered in synagogues with Jesus, they gathered along the Sea of Galilee, 
In the New Testament times, they gathered with Paul and the other apostles in homes, and then eventually they would gather in churches as we do today to hear the word of God taught and read. And Isaiah 55 says, uh, so my word goes out from my mouth and it will not return to me empty, but it will accomplish the very purposes for which I have set it out. And so the word of God did just that. It helped these wise men accomplish the purposes for which they had set out. They sought to seek Christ, the Messiah. They used the word of God and the word of God eventually led them to where they would worship baby Jesus. I've been blessed to watch how community works in this church. I want to tell you one of the best blessings of my life. I've been in a covenant group for the last 11 years here at Marvin Church. I've got one faithful friend who's been in that group with me, several that have been all along the journey. Some have moved away, others have come in. But what I've watched recently is one of the younger, newest guys in our group has approached one of the older guys in the group and said, hey, will you meet with me weekly or maybe bi-weekly so that we can study the word of God together so that we can encourage each other in the faith that I could learn from you? Isn't that a blessing? So friends, there's no reason for us to go the journey alone. There are people in this church today that if you would just approach them and say, I would like to uh, meet with you regularly and study the word, or is there a group that you're in that I could possibly join that you could be a part of learning together what God's truths are for us? People meeting together, whether it's one or with a group, helps us keep the seeking for Christ active it keeps what, what theologian and author John Piper calls mental coasting from happening in our lives. Can you relate to that? Have you ever gone through life in a certain season of time where you just kind of mentally are coasting? You're not really pursuing anything. You're not really striving to grow in Christ. You're just kind of going through the motions. It happens to us when we get tired and weary. It's times when we get distracted. There's a term called spiritual atrophy that happens. Sometimes it's just apathy. We kind of lose interest in Jesus. Sometimes we just get rebellious and we stop looking or seeking. I have to tell you a funny story. This occurred back in Baton Rouge in my, in my days there. Brian was in middle school and Rebecca was in elementary school. And when Brian would have friends over, guess where Rebecca would want to be? Right in the midst of it. She loved her older brother. She always wanted to be with her older brother and his friends. And so Brian figured out a game called hide and seek. And you know where this is going because maybe you're an older brother too. Rebecca, you go and hide and we'll come find you. Next thing I know, they're out there playing basketball or doing something outside while Rebecca's hiding in the house. Well, friends, sometimes we just get rebellious. We stop seeking after God, but be, hear this truth. God never hides from us. God never wants to not be found. In fact, the scriptures tell us that if we will seek him and truly seek him with all our heart, we shall truly find him. And Hebrews eleven six 6 states, whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he will reward those who seek him. The Magi believed that a special child existed and they sought after him. And they were rewarded for their seeking when they had the opportunity to bow their knee and bring their gifts to our King, Jesus, our Lord. I love that. And as I thought about what I just said, as I saw it on paper, and I saw that scripture, Hebrews 11, about God rewarding those who seek him, a thought came to my mind. Maybe worship is the reward for seeking Christ. Sometimes we think of worship as a duty. Sometimes we think of worship as something we have to do or just we're in the habit of doing. But what if we begin to think of worship as the reward for seeking Christ? What if we think of coming and kneeling here at the chancel rail this morning and receiving this holy meal together in a faith community after hearing the word proclaimed as a reward for making the effort in seeking Christ this day? It brings a whole new light to worship. And that's a desire that I have for going into 2019 to continue to have high expectations for my encounter with God in this beautiful space. Well, I knew this week I was gonna preach on commitment 
about making a commitment to Christ and then watching the ripples of water out of that commitment begin to impact your life. So I began to look up commitment and I began to reflect on commitment and I was drawn to the idea of a new TV show called The Titan Games. Anybody see this on Thursday evening? Maybe you've seen the advertisements for it. The Titan Games is hosted by Dwayne Johnson, The Rock. And if you don't know what Dwayne looks like, he is a rock. He is big, he is broad, he is bald, and he is Samoan, and he is, he's, every, he's just a big, huge guy. And I began to study about what it takes to be on the show called The Titan. And I realized that, friends, there are 100,000 applicants who sought to be on the show called The Titan. Out of 100,000 applicants, 100 were chosen to try out. And once those 100 tryouts took place, they only selected 64 individuals to compete. So when you turn on the show on Thursdays on NBC and you watch these individuals compete, you're watching the best of the best. The 64 chosen out of 100,000. And there's some interesting stories about these individuals, how old they are. On Wednesday, uh, Thursday night, I watched a 50-year-old grandmother beat a 28-year-old woman in a competition, and I was amazed. Ingrid calls that adult-onset uh, athleticism. <laughs> it happens, she says. I, I'm not an example of it, but I know it happens. But friends, the point of all this is, I found a story about a, na a man named Ben Afuvai from Tacoma, Washington. He's 32 years old. He's from Samoa himself. He's Samoan himself. He wants to be like the rock. It's his idol. He aspires to be just like him. He's been training for years and he found out about the rock, uh, this competition called the Titan Games and he was determined that he would be one of the competitors and he has made it to the final 64. He's increased his mental strength and body strength in profound ways. He has lost 67 pounds in the process. He hopes to win $100,000 like the others. And I just thought about his commitment. I thought about what it must have taken for him to orient his life around this one competition and to be in that kind of shape, both physically and mentally. And then I watched the show and I watched two competitors compete. And after 10 minutes of airtime, one was sent home never to be seen again. And I thought about the reorienting of one's life in such a way to try to get to that level of competition and to be able to win. And I just had a thought. What if Christians had that kind of commitment to seeking Christ? What if this man, instead of wanting to be like Dwayne Johnson wanted to be like Jesus Christ. What if he studied the word of God with such conviction and passion and got around others who encouraged him and nurtured him in the faith and, and, and kept him accountable and helped him grow to be like Christ? What would it look like if we had a country filled with people committed to Jesus Christ like these athletes are committed to their time on television and their time to win the Titan Games? Jesus said, Seek first the kingdom and his righteousness. All these things will be added unto you. Friends, you want to have a profound 2019? You want to have your life ripple into this community with love and hope and passion and joy and faithfulness? Can I encourage you to recommit your life to Jesus Christ in a significant way today? To reorient your life in such a way that Christ is truly first in your life. And let's see what God can do in our community. A commitment to Jesus is truly a life-enlarging commitment. Let us pray. Lord God, as we start this new year, the challenge is out there to renew our commitment to you, to hear from scriptures of old that those who seek you will truly, truly find you. That is our desire, Lord. Not that we would become apathetic or that we would give up or even be rebellious. 
Not that we would get sluggish in our, or lazy in our spirituality, but that we with new fervor would pursue you with all that we have, just like competitive athletes pursuing a goal to win a prize. Let us run the race. Let us run the race of faith. And may we be nurtured and encouraged this day, not only by the word that's proclaimed, but by the meal that we now share. In Jesus, the Savior's name we pray. Amen. Amen.